So let's just extend a hand toward these people. They are reproducing every good thing that we've ever taught them around the country, locally and translocally, on the mission field as well. Father, we just release the anointing of God to be upon them, and that there is even now a new measure for 2014, that I just hear the Lord saying that this is a day where I'm going to bring those things which are dormant to the surface, but they're going to come forward like an artesian well, and that even this day there's an impartation of anointing for a, for a, a, a double fold, uh, a double fold, triple fold, hundred fold blessing upon you. That God is saying this is the time of El Shaddai, the God of multiplication, the God who is more than enough, the God who is more than sufficient. So there's going to be an overflow and an abundance. Your cup's going to run over with the ability to give and there will always be plenty. You're never going to go dry. There's going to be fruit this season and that you're going to be like, a, like trees planted by the rivers that wherever that river flows, it's going to produce life and that river's flowing out of your innermost being and it's flowing to touch the lives of many people. Father, we just pray right now that God is... Uh, bringing a series of promotions to, to Cliff right now and, and Stina, and they're just bringing them in. It's a promotion that's coming neither from the east or the west, but it's God that lifts up one and puts down another. God's taken rich, and he's basically saying, God, God says, I placed you for this time and for this season. And though I'm, I'm going to take you through the threefold process, I'm taking you from, from both the, the, the pit to the prison to the palace. And God says in that process, you're going you're gonna to look back on the days of old and say it was worth it, it was worth it, it was worth it. Because where I'm about to take you, he says, other people have feared to tread. And you will, you will go in places because of my anointing, and you will move in the kratos that has been talked about and demonstrated in this place. You will walk in a level of dominion authority, and you shall be a father. And I would just say to, to Eric and Mimi, that God has put you in that cold, frozen climate up there. And God says, but you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to take you and I'm going to bring you to the cold and the frozen that are even in the south. And I'm going to cause you to warm their hearts and melt them. And it's going to cause the iceberg that's on the inside of them to melt away. And there's not going to be no Titanics in your life from this point on. That this is a time and a season where God says, you've been through the fire, you've been tested. And that the trials and the tribulations in the future are going to be those things that you're going to say, uh-huh, been there, done that. And I know how to respond properly. And the Spirit of the Lord is saying that... Uh, that you can, you can slip off the path, but you're going to get right back on quickly. There's going to be a prompt obedience that's going to rise up on a new anointing because mega grace is coming forth into your ministries. And God's saying that those things that you've done in, the, in, the, uh, in, in seasons past in small groups, God says, I'm going to bring you into larger groups because you're going to be able to teach, teach the larger groups because you're going to have sufficiently trained the small groups. You're going to be able to teach the larger groups. And just the way the tribes camped around uh, the temple in the wilderness, so I'm going to cause the little groups to be camping around the centrality of your base. God's saying, I've caused you to be a base. I've caused you to move an apostolic anointing. And you, daughter, you've moved in the prophetic. But God's saying that there is a new unction right now to work hand in hand with the apostolic so that it's a joint ever that you and your husband are a team and that you're moving together. And God loves your differences. And God says, I'm going to take those differences and they're going to they're going to be a complement to one another and they're going to be that which is going to be used in the days ahead as a new anointing something that never existed before as an individual anointing it's a new creation it's something that i'm doing upon you right now and daryl and judy daryl and judy would just say right now that daryl god has taught you that in the in the ability to disciple god's causing you he says i've caught you've caught more than you've taught. And God's saying the time's coming right now where you're going to begin to release those things which have been caught. And you're, God's going to give you an unction and an anointing to say it with the simplicity of Christ and return people to the simplicity of Christ. And I can see you right now, people are going to say that Daryl and Judy have been in the presence of Jesus. They've been in the presence of Jesus and you're going to be an adequate witness. And it's not going to be in how you explain it, it's going to be in presence. That you're going to move from program evangelism to uh, power evangelism to presence evangelism and that you're going to move into the place to where you're evangelizing the heart by the mere presence of, of basically displacement and the anointing of displacement is going to be upon your life. And, and to my natural son, and, and I say to Jason that, uh, that from times old, God has called you to walk up and he called you at the age of five and a half into a salvation experience and he showed you the things that were yet to come. And God says that you have, you have uh, been obedient in these days and God says, I've restored you back to the railroad 
railroad track of your life and the fulfillment of your destiny but you're going to go further and farther than anything that I've shown you in the past because I could not unfold to you all the things that I want to do in your life but God says the things that I have showed you are going to be coming to pass in 20 to 4, 2014 and the things that have yet to come in the following years for God says that there is a there is a new course of action that's going to take place there's going to be a shift and a transition at the very turn of the year by our calendar there's going to be a, a, a significant change and a turn up and I just say to this and, and also there's a fatherly anointing on this man in the name of Jesus and it's an apostolic calling that lies dormant but it's going to come forth in the days ahead and it's going to come forth to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers and God's just saying I'm going to return you to Ecuador because there's a time and a season where Colombia and Ecuador are going to need what you have and that God's saying that I'm going to take you back to former missionaries and to people that you've seen in times past and God's going to rekindle old old relationships. And he says it's going to be short term. It's not going to be for the long term because you're going to be equipping them both abroad and stateside. You're going to be equipping them. And and for those that are Spanish speaking, uh, actually we've got two. So let me pray for the ones that's Spanish speaking. They're fluent. Father, in the name of Jesus, those that are fluent in the, in the name of Spanish, God is opening up a whole new a whole new dimension uh, for your anointing. And, and, and for even those in the congregation, know this, they're going to be an integral part of taking the full stature approach into, into countries and nations that are Hispanic. And God is going to use them in a significant way. For God has yet to touch the, the Hispanic population with the message of full stature we've been all over with Sid Roth but the Hispanic population it by and large is is the next arena that's going to be approached and so father we release that right now and to Kim a true daughter in the spirit one that God had brought us in, into our path many many years ago and said that, that that she was going to be a significant part in this in the fullness of time she came forth and came down and basically got rooted and planted in here and she's an integral part of us knit together uh, in the fabric of what God is doing but God says your mission days are not over yet either for God says I'm about to oh, I'm about to in, bring you uh oh but there, a lot of this missions work a lot of this missions work is stateside I'm gonna be I'm gonna be sending you to places even stateside as a missionary as an emissary as an ambassador uh, coming from the the team embassy you shall go forth as a representative and you shall you shall begin to ignite the hearts of many to want more and you will draw many of them to even come back here to home base for training in the days ahead in Jesus name and to this old woman of God, every time I prophesy to her, I get in trouble. When I didn't want a pastor, and I was just going to do traveling ministry the rest of my life, because I'm called to the body at large. I'm not called to a local assembly. I'm called to the body at large. I said, oh, woman of God, God's made you a shepherd, and you're going to shepherd the sheep again? And I'm, I'm going, wait a minute. If she's going to shepherd sheep again, where am I? So, Father, I just hear the Spirit of the Lord. Oh, prophetess, you've been ordained as a prophetess by Bishop Hammond. And in those days, he read your mail like a book. He just said, oh, daughter, he says, There's gonna, it's going to be harder for you not to prophesy than to prophesy. And in the days ahead, God's saying that you think you haven't seen anything yet because you are a candidate. I've heard the cry of your heart, and you're crying out for mega grace. You're going to be there on the forefront when the mega grace opens up. And when the, oh, when the onset of the awakening, you're going to be first in line. As, as, a, as a student, you were always an A student, and you always had to be be the, the, the best A student. God says, I'm going to put you in the front of the line in my kingdom because you're going to be an A student in my kingdom. And that which you've learned and that which you've uh, taught and that which you broke down and made granular for the benefits of other people, God says, you haven't seen anything yet, daughter. And no, he says, uh, you, you look for a pipeline. You look for a pipeline, the daughter. He says, but I'm going to pleasantly surprise you like I always do. I'm going to do it in a way that you never thought of. And I'm going to bl pleasantly bless you because with spiritual children, sons and daughters are coming. And they're coming and they're coming and they're coming. And more and more and more. And they're going to reproduce 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 and even this day there's a reproduction anointing on you no more kids reproduction <laughs> anointing is going to reproduce spiritual children you never know this woman's pulled some fast ones on me before all right so father in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for that reproduction anointing and that there is a spirit of El Shaddai, the mighty breasted one, the God who is more than enough, the God who is the milk and the meat and, and the overflowing cup, the, that he's more than sufficient and there's going to be a release of that anointing of sufficiency in the days ahead. And so, Father, we just uh, thank you for this now in Christ's name. I want to give it to some of these prophetic people here. you got a word that pertains to anybody up here or me. Or the church, maybe? Can we, church? You guys are such a good-looking church, you know. It's, I need to talk a little while so I can get used to my accent, right? This is, right yeah. No, um, I, I, uh, wait. 
Okay, for South Carolina. Here we go. Uh, you know, we drove through the night coming down here, and I, I had this kind of encounter where I saw like a bunch of uh, men linked arm in arm, old time men, and there's there's something in this state where you guys are really, there's an anointing to take a stand. Um, but then, just doing worship actually, and there's an anointing in the room here now, just so you all know, and uh, I, I, I got a glimpse of, I don't know if it's the angel for the state, but there's a, I just saw this angel that's called, that was almost like it was here when the first uh, Europeans arrived, but there's a spirit in this state that says come, right? And so there's a spirit that you, when you, whenever you guys join in with, with this call in this state, which is saying, come Lord, you know, come have your way, you're going to align with heaven in a way that, and when you align with heaven, you're going to see stuff. And so there's something in the state where you guys can call, call stuff in because you're aligning with the angelic and there's an anointing here to do that. And I felt for this church though, um, we're on our way down to um, St. Augustine and my buddy has a sailboat down there and he's never sailed it before. He's owned it for five years. And for the first time, we're gonna set sail. Uh, we're gonna hoist up the sheets here. And, and I, I almost feel like it's a picture of what the Lord even has for this church, where you guys are gonna begin to impart in a season where you guys are actually gonna set sail. Each person here, uh, not just Dennis modeling it. And I, I almost feel like there's, there's like a, a mant on you guys as, as uh, captains of a ship. Um, and I mean, you guys, run a, you guys run a tidy ship, you know? Even the decor here kind of reminds you got to sail here, and it's, this is about as white as a ship could be. <laughs> anyway, but but I really believe the Lord is going to send you guys out on on a, a on a uh, on a voyage, and so just buckle up and, and let the winds of the Spirit. You guys have been really well equipped, but I just want to I just want to so I just let me just decree that over this church, the Lord. So we just Lord, we thank you for the work of preparation that you've been doing, Lord, and Lord for that foundational principle of forgiveness, God. And I thank you, Lord. Lord, as, these, as, as each person Lord, releases forgiveness, God, Lord, that you are, Lord, even as a collective body, God, that you're commissioning this church out. Uh, you're sending them on a voyage, God, uh, where the wind of the Spirit will really be their guide, Lord. And so I just thank you for the, um, for the captains, Lord, in the sense of this ship, Lord, the mama and papa of this ship, Lord, the clerks. So we just bless them. But Lord, I bless every participant in this, in this work, Lord, that they will have heavenly encounters, Lord, Lord, that they will prophesy, Lord, that they will come into the full stature as this ministry is titled. So we just bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't want to promote myself here, but the word the Lord gave us some time ago was, was an admiral. I'm going above captain. <laughs> but the admiral was basically had an armada. And our vision and our goal was to have, you know, the sailboats in the olden days when they did battle, they traveled in armadas. And I really believe that each person has the wind of the Spirit blowing in their sail. Mind, will, and emotions, when it's under the control of the Holy Spirit, the will of God flows through it. You become, uh, there's going to be a wind that blows your life one way or another. And that wind's either going to be good or evil. It's either going to be the Holy Spirit or it's going to be the ways of the world. But the wind that blows the sail of your heart and the mind, will, and emotions is like, is like a sail. And God wants the Lordship of Jesus to be the, in the wind of the Spirit to blow us into the direction. And I believe that there's an armada with plans and purposes to reproduce according to kind. And that God has given us uh, a, a strategy and a warfare strategy, an apostolic career, which is basically stratia or warfare the weapons of our stratia our warfare the weapons of our apostolic career and so father we're we're calling forth in this day of apostolic anointing that it's all the ships that are important and just like on a chessboard the, the pawns on a chessboard are not insignificant because they hold a place of kratos and dominion and authority and if you remove one pawn it makes other people vulnerable so each and every one has intrinsic value don't ever lose sight of that you are valuable in the kingdom of god it's not the it's not the the rooks the pawns the kings the queens it's not by the degree of their authority but it's by their unity and their ability to stand in the realm where they've been placed and to operate the way god made them to be placed and it's these people right here that i believe that god has had significant anointing on in my life and in the days ahead are going to see reproduction at a level beyond anything they've known before the scripture that god laid on my heart was matthew 13 verse 52 in the amplified bible in the Amplified Bible, it says, He said to them, Therefore, every teacher 
an interpreter of the sacred writings who has been instructed about and trained about and trained for the kingdom of heaven has become a disciple he is like a householder who brings forth out of his storehouse treasures that is new and treasures that are old the fresh as well as the familiar and what I learned was that uh, sometimes there's things that God quickened to me as a baby Christian and people say oh yeah I remember you told me that but the funny thing is is that when I told you that I am now a different person than I was then when I told you that and I found out that God looks at the scripture the same way for us when I was a baby Christian my railroad track scripture was that I might know him Philippians 3.10, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person. And it just lit me up on the inside, and I've never lost sight of that. But when I say it now, I'm a different person than when he gave it to me as a baby Christian. So even though it impacted me, there is a further clothing of truth. There is a deepening of that revelation. And that's why God says, I can take something old and then add to it the new and the fresh revelation that I've been giving to you, and it will have a different meaning. It will be deeper, clearer, and more powerful. I believe that what God is doing right now is just such a thing. Uh, we had some messages that were foundational and life-changing way back in the traveling days, and they were only on cassette. We never even switched them over to CDs. And I looked at some of those messages that were so instrumental when we traveled, and I says, what, what God's taught us now, I could add a, an entirely new dimension to that. And I'm saying, you know what? It's time that we got some of these things off of cassette and put it on new. Because God is taking the fresh as well as the familiar. And God is blending it together. And he's making it come alive and go even deeper. And I'm a firm believer that if you preach, you're going to preach out of substance. And if that substance has gone deeper, then it deserves being said again. Don't you think? Don't you have bi uh, scriptures written in your Bible that were important even in the very beginning? It doesn't lose its importance because in, in a reality, God will take you back to those same scriptures to fortify in you that that truth is one area where you get back on track again. Look at those original. What, he knows you better than you know yourself. He knit you together in your mother's womb. When he gives you key scriptures that, that just get written on the tablet of your heart, it's for your good. It's for your safety in many cases. It's to get you back on track. Well, anyway, we have a lady. We, have, uh, we have, always have a lot more Ustream viewers than we have in this room. And one lady uh, had a dream. And it was kind of funny. We're going to title this message it. Uh, in this dream, she had this person come named William. And let me tell you a little bit about William in the dream. Uh, and it says, let me tell you about Will. He's a bit bossy, overbearing, and when pushed, he's known to be even mean and underhanded. No one can really trust him, but he was always there and talked to me about what to do when I was going to be hurt or in pain. He would always basically say, if you're going to be in any kind of discomfort, I'm going to advise you as to what to do because after all, I'm concerned about your comfort level. Uh, he's always insistent upon his own way. He would tell me what people were thinking and planning behind my back so I could get prepared. He just wanted me to be safe. He didn't like change, though. He hated to be put in situations that made him unsure about people or surroundings. And he would try to steal the attention whenever he could get it. He was so aggressive that at times I tried to keep and cover him up, but it didn't always work. And then I'd be embarrassed and shamed. He liked to remind me how many times I failed and what a screw up I was. He reminded every time I did something awful, I did as though he were my conscience. I know that he's a poser and a liar and a cheat and everything that is real and good. He robs me of sincere faith because he convinced me to be fearful. And as you use the tools of the word so that the Holy Spirit could circumcise my heart, I now, I never want to go through that again. I died a thousand deaths, but it gave me sight. I suddenly saw William. Will I am. I am willful. I am will was the problem. And in reality, for the believer, Satan wants your will. God wants your will. And William will I am 
That's what we're going to title this message, Will hyphen I hyphen am. But I thought it was kind of neat because she had this horrific dream and this, this man came in with a helmet and was bombarding her and then she's listening to Dennis on Ustream and he's brutalating, brutalating, <laughs> that's a new word, brutalating, that's really terrible brutality. And he has literally beaten her with the will, saying you've got to surrender your will to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. All you willful people just love me. I don't care how willful, I don't care if you're a mover or shaker, you're going to be brutalized because the will was meant to be yielded to not work that harder. And the will, when we traveled, was such a significant topic. I saw 98% of a church, some of the best churches in the New England area, when I'd say, all right, to the congregation, where's your will? 98% pointed to here. It's amazing that you got saved because you did it by accident. You opened the door of your heart, which is the will. The problem is they don't know where to locate. This is your will, not here. Jesus didn't stand at the door of your head and knock. Well, maybe he did, some of you might have needed board on the side of the head, then you open your heart and go, okay, okay. All right, I yield, I yield. But you don't even hear the word yield in churches, do you? You hear do, be a doer of the word, but you can't do something you haven't received and you can't receive something you're not open to yield to. So you need to own it first. So anyway, I think that you streamer who was frightened by the warrior bearing a blue metal helmet and found out that it was William and that William was Will, I am. So in light of that, I want to cover, um, I'm going to give you a shorter version than what I gave in the morning service because I want to get right to the nitty gritty. There's three sets of I wills that need to be understood. The first one is that headstrong William or that willfulness. Satan wants your will. God wants your will. Do you agree with that? God works from the inside out. Satan works through the emotion door. I mean the mind door and the emotion door to get your will. That's his only. But he's working from the outside. He needs permission. And you've got to learn how that, that will belongs to God. And I learned many, many, many years ago that without schooling, and thank God I didn't go to some schools before God taught me in the school of the Spirit, that my will and His will was a delight. It was a divine romance of wills. To properly understand your will is, I delight to do thy will. I have food that you know not of. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. The will of God and the pleasure of God are inseparable. And religion has brought drudgery into the will of God. Like you're going to be miserable. You do the will of God and you're going to lose all personal happiness. Really? And yet you cannot escape God's will from his pleasure because he loves his children to such a degree that if you would obey his will, things will go well with you. He didn't make rules, to, arbitrary rules to make you feel miserable. He made rules that life might go well with you. Honor your mother and father that things may go well with you. To the degree you don't honor mother and father, things don't go well. It's that simple. It's a law of sowing and reaping. And God's basically put those laws in the universe to be a blessing. But you can work against it and it can work against you. But that's, you know, that's the will, okay? So... The first thing that I saw was that the, the, the straightest line to a destination is from the point of departure, there are detours, but there's a destination. Do you agree? Now, when I say a point of departure, I'm, I'm saying for all of us, it was the born again experience. That was the beginning of the journey. That wasn't an end in itself. It was clearly a beginning. And our departure was from that place of victory. We now move in life. But many people have been detoured. And I'm concerned, and I know a lot of other preachers are, are concerned about the fact that born-again Christians, the number of born-again Christians who no longer attend church increases every year. I'm saying born-again Christians. And it's because of an offense. 98%, 99%, but I'd, I'd go so far as to say almost all of them, it's an offense somehow. 
They were offended by Christians, by leaders, by something. But the problem is, God says for 2014, and listen to this because I know this is a prophetic statement. This will be for our church clearly. And, and God usually puts something in me that's bigger than our church. But this word for 2014 is that God is going to teach you to be unoffensive and unoffendable for 2014. He's going to teach us to move in kratos, dominion, authority, and advance. I've taught for years to people how to, how to receive forgiveness and repent properly so that they're cleansed and clean of the things that are debilitating to them. But you could stay a victim the rest of your life getting clean. I say that God's saying, I'm moving now to a time of advancement, a time to where you're going to be unoffendable. And I knew in the past a lot of people have said they were unoffendable, but to me they were just a wrecking ball. <laughs> and they were unoffendable. They didn't need to forgive anybody, but there's about a thousand people that were, that were on their face before God going, oh, please forgive them, please. Oh, God, forgive me for hating them. I want to kill them. I'd like to murder them. You know. But as far as they're concerned, they, I don't need to forgive anybody. No, you always got your way. You were so willful, you always got your way. You don't have to forgive nobody. The problem is there's many people on their knees trying to forgive you. So there's a, there's a double edge to this sword. God is going to teach us to be unoffendable to where we're no longer victims, but that we're going to learn to resist. And to the degree you resist with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, not willpower, to the degree you learn to resist by supernatural, by the peace of God ruling in your heart, to the degree you resist, you mature. And in that maturing, you build layers of spiritual prowess and you become redemptive oriented to the hurt and wounded people. And you will begin to process them through. And we're going to get to that a little later. But I really believe that God is saying for 2014, I'm going to bring a people who are unoffensive. What does that mean to be unoffendable does not mean hard and callous. Unoffendable simply means that the love of God is pressing me on all sides. It eliminates all other options. It's so much that the love of God is that, is that while you're picking on me and you're my enemy, I, go, I bless them that curse me. I pray for them that this. I'm going to do good to them that hate me. You can be so God confident. The weakness in the church is not so much a belief that they've been called of God, but a weakness in the God confidence. I've seen too many people that know beyond a shadow of a doubt they're called to be a missionary, they're called to do this, they're called to do that, but their confidence is in the calling, not in God. And you will, it will trip you up in time because they're waiting for something to happen when God says, I'm looking for baby steps of obedience in the day-to-day -day routine and a will that's yielded and surrendered to me. And so God is saying, basically, I'm going to bring a God-confident people that are unoffendable. They're going to bless them that curse. But... How will you know that they're unoffendable? Is in the midst of, of persecution, in the midst of being used and abused. Nobody likes that word. That'll trigger a bunch of stuff <laughs> for ministry. Used and abused. Isn't that funny? We have all these wounds from being used and abused. And it's not funny because many people were hurt and wounded. But at the same time, what do you tell God? Use me, use me, God, use me. But then if he tries to use you, you go, oh, I ain't going to be used. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do my will, my will, my will. Will I am. William is coming down today. William has been exposed. The blue helmeted man in that woman's dream is William. And will I am is in us and he's rising up. And he is bossy and he is pushy. and he is. So we don't want that kind of unoffendable. We want tender hearted, caring, loving, merciful at the same time. I believe God's going to raise up an army of people that are going to be so saturated with the love of God that they're going to look forward to purposely blessing them that they know can't give anything back to them. That's going to be the acid test. When you do good to them that hate you and you don't expect anything in return and you're doing it as unto God because you're reflecting the way dad would do it, then you're, then you're depicting uh, being a, 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 a son and a daughter of God. So uh, in, <clears throat> in all of these things, I believe that there's a, p a group out there, and I want to speak to this group because I believe God's equipped full stature with the necessary tools to deal with people if you did come back. The first thing you do when you come back is you don't need put to work. Do you hear me? And if you're out there, I don't know about any other church, I can't speak for other church, but if you come to this church, you don't get put to work. You come back, you get 
feel safe and secure. You need a safe and a secure environment. You need to be loved on. You need the wool of sheep to bring your healing because God doesn't have a plan B. So all because you've been offended. And we will teach you two things. We will teach you how to deal, how to deal with your issues and how to deal with agendas. And when I teach you how to deal with your issues, God can basically cleanse you and wash you from that. Let's pray for that right now. Let's just do that. Father, in the name of Jesus, the hurt and the pain that I've suffered has not been in the world. The hurt and the pain that I've suffered, I've suffered in the church of Jesus Christ. And I've been hurt and wounded. And right now, I'm asking for Christ and Christ alone to rise up in my heart. Christ the forgiver. I can't do it. I can't do it. I am allowing Christ the forgiver in me to do it. And there's a trumpet call calling forth people that have been hurt and offended and wounded. That only Jesus can take your pain and your sorrow. No pastor, no person, nobody can take it. And you can't suppress it because whatever you suppress will get expressed later. So Father, by the, there it is right there. There it is. There's the healing right there. It's flowing. Father, I thank you. The anointing's increasing dramatically right now. I welcome the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The same comfort whereby you comforted us during our time of affliction. I am now comforting you in my presence. Thank you, Lord. Increase, 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 increase. Let's minister. Let's minister to him right now. Can we do that? Father, we just pray right now that... But, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to release the love of God. And it's going to heal all of the old stuff. If you're watching by Ustream, there's so much old stuff where you got hurt and offended. And you know what? Some of those offenses were not even real. Some of them were very real. But some of them weren't real. They were your interpretation of what was happening. It's so, a Father, we release the love of God right now. There's a fresh anointing flowing in here right now. And it's a mega grace flowing out and cleansing beyond some of your deepest healing. God's doing a sovereign work even now on Ustream. God, he's doing a work that God says, I am found that that willfulness on my part, it's either going to be owned by God God or the enemy? It's either going to be the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, or the law of sin and death. It's the only two choices I have. There's an increase in the anointing. There's an increase of the comfort. That same comfort whereby you've been comforted, we minister that comfort in Jesus' name. Let the power of the Holy Spirit accomplish that work for which he began. He began a good work. He's going to continue it. Increase, increase, increase. I want you to write this down, and if you're listening by Ustream, I want you to write these five points. The darkest night of my life, God took me, and he showed me the I wills of Satan. Those five I wills of Satan were, was what pride and willfulness will do to you. How many know where that's at in Isaiah 14? Okay, Isaiah 14 basically says, <clears throat> I will ascend into heaven. I'm going to promote myself. Exaggeration. I will exalt my throne. Uncontrolled ambition. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. Domination. I will dominate. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I'm going to take a position for myself. I will be like the Most High God. Imitation. That is William, or the willfulness of man, when left alone. When the will of man is left alone, that's where it goes, the same way it went with Lucifer. And everything that he wanted, the interesting thing is God would have given him under the Lordship, under his Lordship. But he chose to get it for himself. This is when you need to get your hands off of it. All right, so is that kind of clear? That's kind of self-explanatory? That's the way you don't want to go. That's the way of pride. I will, the five I wills of Lucifer are the ways that we are all susceptible to in the flesh, okay? Now, I want to get your will to the prophetic stance of what the prophet Micah did. There were five I wills in Micah 7, 7 through 9, and we're going to pray this through with you right now. This is what Micah did when he was in a hard place. And this is what... 
God basically, in my hardest hour, took me to Micah 7, 7 through 9, and he walked me through these five areas for my will. Five I wills of a prophetic stance that's going to make you God confident and victorious to face any pain and any sorrow. Micah 7, 7 through 9. It basically says... <clears throat> I will look to the Lord. My life's a mess, I'm hurt, I'm wounded, and I don't feel good. But I'm gonna look to the Lord. He basically said, I'm gonna fix my undivided attention upon him. It's like, it's singular, it's a single eye. My, I will to focus on one thing, this one thing, Christ alone. I will fix. I will look to the Lord. It's a fixed gaze of anticipation. This is the only place, this is the only answer I've got is God. The second I will. I will wait. Wait in both the Greek and the Hebrew is to sink into him that he rises up in your life that impacts the world around you. Be still means to sink into as being clothed. When you sink into him, the peace of God guards your heart and your mind. You actually are in image at that time as a believer. When you sink into God, you see him and he sees you, reveals you to yourself. All right? But it says, I will wait. That means I'm going to sit still till love comes through. That means I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. The third element was, don't rejoice over me, my enemy, because when I fall, I will get up. What God told me the weakness is, and there's people that have dropped out of church, and they say they love God, and they're born again, and they have all kinds of good intentions, but in that detached thing, they've lost sight that God only has the bond to be covered in the love of God, to really love God. It's in the bonds of peace and reconciliation, and it requires a body. But God says, when I fall down, I will get up. I found out that most people, when they're down, they have a tendency to stay down and wallow in it. And then they get so used to it, that's normal. And God's saying, just like a boxer when he gets knocked down and they're doing the countdown, the anticipation is that he's going to get up. That needs to be our anticipation, that when I'm down, when I fall, I will arise. The only time falling is fatal is for the unbeliever. The unbeliever, falling them, it's done. They're done. But for the believer, though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. I'm going to pray right now. Some of you need to get up. Some of you are sitting on a couch, you're watching this, and you're saying, uh, I, 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 you don't understand, there's no church around me, and I, uh, I've been to the local church, and they don't like me, and I don't like them. I don't belong, I don't fit, all that kind of stuff. I've heard this all before. But what God is basically saying is, is that you're wallowing in something, and you're in self-deception, because you're not bouncing that off of anybody but yourself. And, and what God's saying is you need to get up off that couch and find where did God place you. For God established the exact time in which you would live and the exact place in which you would live. Therefore, there is a place for you. He places the solitary in families. You need to find it. And you need to know that if you find that place, God will direct you to the place that will receive you, first of all, and give you the chance to get safe and secure first to feel like it's a safe environment. Then you can open up and deal with your issues. Then you can even die to some of those willful agendas that you use as a substitute for a walk with God. Willful agendas, plans, goals, a lot of that is just to fill the time as a substitute for a walk with God. You may have to lay some of those down. You may have to lay down some of your dreams. This lady that gave me this dream about William, she said, this is when I annihilated her when I was telling her that some of your dreams and some of your visions and some of your plans and some of your goals, some of that's man-made. That's not all God. And kind of got her upset. Because I don't want to lay that down. Because William <laughs> rises up and wants what he wants, and he usually wants it now. And he wants it his way. So the willfulness has to be surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the, the fourth element of the I wills of Micah 7, it says, I will, 
I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I've sinned. In other words, if I've got off track, I will accept the loving discipline of God because he's not out to punish me. He's out to bring me back on the road to life and get me back to the destination. So he says, he will bring me forth and there's a good end coming. The fifth element is I will see his righteousness. I will see the day hope lives with the openness of the heart to see the anticipation that love never fails. Somehow love's gonna come through, okay? Now let me make this practical. In my darkest hour, here's what I got out of those five statements. I saw that they were all engaged in, I will, I will, I will. But when I had to walk it out, these were the steps. This is the stuff that'll get you through the hard time. You, wanna, you don't want the I wills of Lucifer, those five I wills. Here's the I wills of a believer. This is the prophetic stance that you need to take. And here's what God basically did for me. He used this. <clears throat> Dennis, number one, write this down. These are the I wills in simple language. Admit your failure. Not only admit your failure, but admit that you were wrong 100%. I once had a man in one, of our, in one of our classes who said, he raised his hand, he said, I don't think I've ever been 100% wrong in my whole life. <laughs> so that was a revelation for him. If you're going to be wrong, be 100% wrong. Admit your failure. God cannot heal ex Christian excuses. So if you've dropped out of church and you dropped out and you're wherever, and you, it's all those other people, you have a responsibility to deal with the offense in the heart. And so admit your failure, step one. Number two, face your pain. The church does everything and anything to avoid pain at all costs. And everything we teach, everything we teach is that if you will apply the cross properly, you will see a horrific situation, a painful situation up here, and you stare it down you don't change the picture and make it pleasant, put Jesus in there hugging you. That's old time goofy stuff, really. Come on, I'm gonna upset some people, but that stuff don't work. You know what you did? You changed the subject and you avoided the cross. I don't picture Jesus doing hugging me when I was being beat by my father. I picture myself being beat by my father. I feel the pain, deal with the reality of it. It's momentary pain. I see him beating me. I feel the pain and I let Christ the forgiver, Christ the forgiver in me go to that pain and through that pain out of my innermost till it changes to peace. My historical record does not get erased. That's nonsense. My God's not an amnesiac. My historical record says my father beat me. My father abused me. And when I say that, here from the historical record and there's peace here I've got the heavenly record in here I've got anointing I've got substance I've got a testimony it is not a testimony for me to say I saw my father beating oh no I see Jesus hugging him and smiling it's okay that made me feel better you see how clever that is it's clever but it doesn't work you just changed history and you just basically found a substitute for the cross of Jesus Christ. Momentary pain for eternal freedom, is that a good deal? Then you learn to face your pain. Some of you, it's pain if you do this and it's pain if you do that. You decide, as long as you decide that there's not a painless way. If you think you found a painless way, you're sadly mistaken. There's pain if you go and there's pain if you stay. But there's pain. You face that pain and you obey God. And I'll tell you what, he'll take your pain and your sorrow. So it's momentary. Face your pain. So what God basically had to do with me is say, no more suppressing and no more denial. No more suppressing, no more denial. All of that does is waste life. You're wasting your life in suppressing it by ignoring, denying that it exists, the third element was that after you face the pain, God basically says, you've got to get up. But I don't feel like getting up. I face my pain. I'm depressed. 
I don't want to see people and I don't want to do nothing. Have you ever heard of that before? Have you ever done that? I don't want to be around people. I don't want to talk to nobody. You know what that means? It means you're down for the count. Did anybody get, ever get so stressed out you took a nap? Hmm? That shouldn't be in the Christian's lifestyle. What that means is you've gotten so stressed out trying willfully to control your life and control people and so busy being offended or trying not to be offended that you wore yourself out. God says, get up from that. Just like when a boxer gets knocked down and the countdown starts, the anticipation is he's going to get up. How much more should you be anticipated? Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets up. Brush yourself off. And then God says, after you get up and you've decided that you're going to walk this out, learn from what you did wrong. If you can make your mistakes redemptive, you could literally apply them to help people's lives and be a redemptive-oriented person. You could learn from the compost pile of your mistakes. You could make a beautiful garden in somebody else's. God will use those mistakes if properly applied, if properly cleansed of the offense. If you're cleansed of the offense, you're, you're, you're clean in here. When you're clean, where, where's the heavenly record? Point to it. Where's the heavenly record? Yeah. So when the scripture says, historically, David was a man after my own heart who will do all my will. We go, what about Bathsheba? What about killing? What about murder? What about it? No, that's the historical record, and it's there for our correction and our proof. But God said, in David's heart, he was clean, Psalm 51. I continually unfolded my past till all was told, and you instantly forgave me. I think that's Psalm I can't remember the verse. Anyway, it's in the Bible. All right. And what God is saying, learn from what you did and then do righteously or do redemptively. That's the fifth step. If you learn the five I wills from Micah, then you learn from that mistake. And then lastly, you do what is right. When you do what is right from properly learning from the mistake, you have substance, you've got life. And that life can give life to other people. But if you can't give something you don't have, if you've never been through the pain and received the, the end result of the peace that God supplies or the supernatural exchange, you don't have anything really worth giving anybody except information. And God's looking for the real thing. So let's go over those five things. And if you're watching by Ustream, you need these five things. Because you know what? You can't just write down these five things and say, and confess after me. Repeat those words and it's going to work. No, 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 no. I got news for you. Those repeat after me prayers oftentimes don't take because the person's not willing to live it. Live these five things the next time you're in a hard place. And those of you that quit going to church and you're watching this, do these five. One, admit you made a mistake. Admit your failure, you're offended, point one. And you have a responsibility. We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. Therefore, we should be the most forgiving. You want to preach a gospel, you love God, then you're good. the gospel is a gospel of, of, of love where the rubber meets the rose, it's reconciliation. So deal with your offenses, release forgiveness, to those people that have offended you and start even blessing them. Pray for them. Do good on occasion to them. But admit your failure. Secondly, if you do it just up here, and I know Christians are clever. They'll go, okay, I remember that pastor that was mean to me. They're, they're operating here. I remember, I remember I was really angry. You ain't gonna get healed. You know why? Because you're not willing to face the pain. You were bought with a price. You have no right to hold back your emotions even from God. If you really forgave that pastor, instead of saying, I remember I was angry, oh, I forgive him. That's mental assent. No. Do you feel, oh, it wasn't just anger, it was hurt. You feel that hurt? Let Christ take that pain and that sorrow. Because then there's a, there's a supernatural transaction that takes place in your spirit. 
I, we're clever. We will avoid pain at all costs. And then here's the other one that's form of denial. I don't have feelings. I never feel. We'll ask someone that knows you if you ever lose your temper. <laughs> if you ever, ha yeah, okay. Or we will smash your foot and see if we get a reaction out of you. Do you feel that? Okay. Don't say you don't have feelings. Nobody believes you. All right. What you're saying is, I usually suppress them. And I usually don't face them. I would rather have somebody come and go, I cast that out of you right now in Jesus' name. And then you feel better. No, you won't. Because as soon as you go back to that pain, it's still there. It doesn't go till Christ takes it. So, learn from it. Now, if I were to admit my failure, face my pain, get back up, learn from it, and then redemptively minister love to other people out of the healing. Out of the healing means it changed in here. There was a supernatural transaction, a supernatural exchange. Then I can give it its substance, its real, its spirit. If I can do that, then you have become what's next, the five I wills of the Father. The five I wills. So we have the five I wills of Lucifer. Are you still with me? Because I haven't been following you very orderly. I'm jumping all over the place. The five I wills of Satan, Isaiah 14. You see, that's wrong. That's pride, willfulness, right? That's William. Micah 7, I gave you what you're supposed to do as a believer with your wills. The same thing that Micah did. I will wait upon the, I will look to the Lord. I will wait upon the Lord. I will, I will, I will, I will. But all of it is in submission to the Lordship of Jesus, right? Here's what people have been taking and claiming Isaiah 91. What did I say? No, no, not Isaiah 91. Psalm 91. Psalm 91. It says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge, my fortress. In Him I will trust. You can't try and trust at the same time. And what it says in this first verse in Psalm 91, 9, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near you. I will keep you in all your ways. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion, the serpent you shall trample underfoot. All of this is what I see is going to be that unoffendable individual whose will is, sur is surrendered in the prophetic stance as a believer, the I wills of the believer. Here's the I wills of the Father. But listen to this. Here's the part we don't skip. How many have seen the promise boxes where they used to have little scriptures and a little, I don't know what it was, a little piggy or what it was. I don't know what, and they pull up. Uh, and they're all blessings. Did you notice that? There's no commandments in those little boxes. They're all promises. It's the promise box. So so perfect for a, an entitlement age, you know, <laughs> for an age of entitlement, promises. But here's what I see. In Psalm 91, 9, it says, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. Beca there was a, there's a prerequisite, isn't there? Before we get into the I wills of the Father God toward the believer, the prerequisite is a because. And the scripture that always came to my mind was, remember when Lazarus was raised from the dead? It says in the scriptures, many believed on Jesus. Because of Lazarus, many believed. In other words, you need to become a because. When you become a because, because he has set his love upon me, you haven't set your love upon him unless the five I, you're comfortable with the five I wills of the believer in Micah. When you're comfortable with the five I wills of the believer in Micah 7, and you're comfortable that his will and my will is a divine romance of wills, and it's a pleasure to yield to his will, then here's the I wills of God the Father. This is the promise for an unoffendable, unoffensive believer who is no longer victim mentality, They've moved beyond getting healed of their issues, and they're moving into the place of being a healing agent to the body of Christ. Blessing them that curse, pray for them that despitefully use. Here's what the scripture says. Because he has set his love upon me, 
Here's the five I wills of God the Father for the believer. But it's not out of the promise box. It's become, it comes because you're a because. You need to be a because. And because he has set his love upon me, I will set him on high and he will know my name. And I like the word nature. Because he has set his love upon me, I will deliver him, which means uh, all of these things I will do because he has set his love upon me. I will set him on high. Isn't that what Lucifer wanted? He wanted to elevate himself, uncontrolled ambition. But God says, I will set the one who's a because, because they have set their love upon me, because they position themselves in their will under my lordship, I will set them on high because they've known my nature. Nature is more important to know than his name. You can learn intellectually the name of God. His nature is by presence. It's by acquaintance. It's by relationship. Secondly, when he will call upon me, I will answer. People say, I'm having trouble hearing from God. I'm having trouble hearing from God. I never had trouble hearing from God. I had more trouble doing what he told me to do. <laughs> It was the obedience thing. I never had trouble, but there was a willingness, but it was always something that I didn't understand or didn't seem logical a lot of times. And I never demanded to understand first. I found prompt obedience caused me to walk in some prosperous ways that I'd have never figured out on my own anyway. Only in hindsight did I see the wisdom of God. So quit leaning on that understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct that path. Become a because... I will set him on high because he's known my nature. Secondly, I will answer him. You're already in communion. When you're in communion, spirit to spirit, and you're under the lordship of Jesus Christ, you're not going to have trouble with the communication at all. The communication is going to be out of a relationship. It's going to be two-way. My sheep hear my voice. God's not up there saying, I'm busy, I can't answer you. When you're being so sincere, he's basically saying you're not positioned properly. You set your heart upon me and you're gonna get all the answers you want that are necessary. Not all the answers you want, but all that are necessary. Thirdly, I will be with him in trouble. The I wills of the Father saying the person because they have set, because they become a because, because their will is properly centered in me, I will not, I will be there. I'm not going to take trouble out of their life, but I will be with them. And he, every great man and woman of God, he came to them with that same statement. I am with you. Moses, I am with you. Jeremiah, I will be with you. Uh, Joshua, I am with you. What he has to say, I am with you, is the most significant thing anyone could have in their life. I want him with me. Remember, most said, if your presence don't go, I don't want to go. All right? Well, God's saying, for the person who becomes a because, I will be with him. The fourth thing he says is, I will deliver him and honor him. Isn't that funny? But Lucifer wanted to honor himself. The flesh, William, wants to honor himself. But he that honors me, him shall I honor. That's what it says in Samuel. If you honor God, he will honor you. Let him do it. Let him promote. With long life, the fifth one, I will satisfy him and let him behold my salvation. Basically saying, I'm going to bring a satisfaction into that individual's life that goes beyond anything they know. I will satisfy him. I will be his exceedingly great reward. I will be the sufficiency. And so, Father, we just pray right now that this most misunderstood area is, number one, we don't know where it's at. One, you locate your will is in the gut, not here. Secondly, the key to real Christian living is that Satan wants your will from the outside. God wants your will from the inside. Yield it to God on the inside. And people think yield means do nothing. When you yield to God, it's like opening the gate valve. There is a fountain in here that's under pressure that flows. It is God who is at work both to will and to perform. He performs. He'll energize. And if you're ministering, it should come out of the overflow and nobody should be sweating or worn out ministering. If you, get, if you perspire and get worn out ministering, and I know many preachers do it, there's something you're doing in your flesh that's not necessary. You're working too hard at it. Because in reality, it's supposed to be God doing the work. 
ministry out of the overflow of what's in your heart should be as easy as walking in the Publix grocery store. It really should. Ministry. Resistance in this world, yeah, that takes, that takes no-so. But ministry should be as easy as that. With long life, I will satisfy him. Locate your will, learn to yield your will, and then let God's will be a delight. And I want to end with this, that there are some that need to come into the revelation that the will of God and his pleasure are synonymous. We say it over and over again, but we have so much religion that creeps in that says the will of God is going to make me miserable and he's going to make me do stuff I don't want to do. So I'm going to hold back my will totally from God and only do certain things for God because I'm afraid if I yield my will all the way, he'll, he'll make me miserable. How many have ever heard that in your head at least? Most Christians have heard that at one time or another. What we're going to do is we're going to surrender this and say, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just release my will to the will of God. I ask by the power of the Holy Spirit that he who began a good work will continue it and that help me to understand that to yield my will to your will is to enter into a pleasure that I've never known, to enter into a satisfaction I've never known. You said, Father, if I became a because and yielded my will, that you would give me long life and that you would satisfy me. You would bring a satisfaction beyond anything I've ever known, beyond anything the world has to offer, beyond anything that I can give for myself. And I just pray right now, and if you're watching by Ustream, I want to pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we release that anointing right now to yield your will more fully and more completely than ever before. And that we, we recognize the fallacy of the I wills and being willful. We understand that God gave us a will. But we don't want to be like the rich young ruler that when he told us to let go, we had to walk away sad because we were so controlling. We basically had to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, that will belongs to you. And I was bought with a price. And William is not going to rise up in my life anymore and destroy it. He is not going to, he's not going to run and be general manager of the universe anymore. God is my general manager of the universe. And I'm, I'm going to allow him to rule and reign in my heart that the peace of God rules. When I lose my peace, somebody... And something in my flesh is campaigning. When, when I lose my supernatural peace in my heart, someone else is campaigning, is campaigning for that rule. And I release, I release myself that it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. This life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And from this day forward, my will is going to be like putty in the hands of God, and he's going to be able to increase increase even the anointing and the influence in our individual lives because he says because they have set their love upon me I will be with them I will I will deliver them I will answer I will satisfy them with good things so father seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit and increase and bring us into a new dimension of freedom in the days ahead and we thank you in Jesus name amen